Divided from Russia by the River Pruth lies Romania, whose sudden break with the Nazis provides one of the war's greatest sensations. Pictures just received from Russia show the events which led to the dramatic announcement that King Michael had made an 11th hour peace with the Allies. Bridges had been blown up by the Germans in their headlong flight from Bessarabia. But the Red Army hadn't chased the enemy all the way from the Volga just to stop at the Pruth. Soviet engineers soon had tanks and support across, with fast-working infantry in close support. The tremendous moment has arrived. The Nazi nightmare has come true. Soviet troops are in Romania, key to the Balkans, with all the equipment of a mighty modern army. Pressing on, the Red Army swiftly overtakes those Germans who have not run quickly enough. Soon the first prisoners to be captured on Romanian soil are being taken eastwards and out of the war. The important Romanian city of Seret is occupied by troops of the 1st Ukrainian Army. The city looks empty. The Germans, fearing that the population of the country is turning against them, have driven the inhabitants westwards. In Botoshani, the largest town in northern Romania, the streets are also empty. Gradually, the inhabitants return to learn that Goebbels has lied to them and that the Russians have no designs on their soil or their homes. And so, as the Red Army marches on in the east and the other allies in the west, Romania decides she has played the German game long enough. As the master race goes down for the count, another disillusioned satellite deserts to the winning side. In Hawaii, the troops scheduled to see action in the Marianas prepared to embark on the journey to the target. General Ralph Smith commanded the Army's 27th Division, one of the three divisions earmarked for the campaign on Saipan. During the last days of May 1944, the men became part of the Northern Troops and Landing Force assigned to the Saipan operation. By the 1st of June, the last elements of the divisions which would oppose the enemy on Saipan were aboard ship, and Operation Forager was begun. While the attack force was en route, word of the landings on the beaches of Normandy came through. But the assault forces on the ships were occupied with their own invasion a campaign just as vital to final victory in the Pacific as the Normandy invasion was to the European triumph. Three days before D-Day on Saipan, scout planes flew reconnaissance missions to search out any enemy naval force. The men were briefed thoroughly on the principal features of the landing area. The task force neared the objective. Before dawn on D-Day, the carrier planes were readied for their last pre-invasion strikes. D-Day morning, June 15th, was bright, clear and hot. U.S. planes continued to work over the target in the teeth of enemy flak. From all appearances, the battle ahead looked like a tough one. provided a staccato introduction to the invasion. The Navy had a wide range of targets to concentrate on. The naval guns worked overtime, 
Now and then they had to be cooled off before going back into action. With each hour less than an hour away, the assault force of Marines who were to carve out the beachhead on Saipan prepared for one more landing against a carefully entrenched enemy. No matter how often a Marine went ashore against heavy enemy opposition, each new landing seemed just as tough or tougher than the last. Even veterans like Marine Private First Class Harry Jackson of Pitchfork, Wyoming, never got really used to the feeling that went with going in on an enemy beach. After a couple of tough landings, you couldn't help figuring that the law of averages was working against you. In a way, it was a good feeling to be on solid ground again, but that meant you were wide open. Even though your buddies were all around, you felt all alone on a beach like Saipan. At least on this one, the men got into the beach. That hard ball in the pit of your stomach never left until you saw the first guy near you get hit. That did it. You wanted to even the score for the guys who got it. Saipan was rough right from the word go, and this time there was a lot more island to take than there was on some of those atolls. The first few hours on the island gave us a good idea of what the campaign was going to be like. Somebody said the 2,000 Marines got hit that first day. Nobody doubted it. They finally called for some more support from the cans offshore. And the Zoomies gave us a hand once in a while, too. After the first couple of days, we had a pretty good idea the place was ours, with no ifs, ands, or buts. Then we moved on in to take over a real chunk of the island. But it wasn't any cinch. tanks were handy to have around. Sometimes you'd be able to save a guy who got hit bad using the tank as a shield. Speaking of things that were handy to have around, those rockets weren't just whistling Dixie. D-Day plus three, we'd taken Aslito Airfield, the enemy's most important air base on the island. The Japs had really had it at Aslito. They pulled out awful fast. The amphibious force which moved northwestward through the far Pacific was to strike at the last two of those islands, Peleliu and Angaur. The naval and troop commanders checked over the planned invasions for the last time. On September 15th, 1944, the assault was begun on Peleliu Island by the men of the 1st Marine Division. The last pre-invasion airstrikes were made, concluding three days of softening up enemy strong points by strafing and bombing. Peleliu was to be invaded and captured so that U.S. forces would gain possession of the vitally important airfield on the island, a key to the control of the Western Pacific area. Before the assault troops stormed ashore on Peleliu, the approaches to the beach were prepared for the first waves of boats. 
This delicate and hazardous job fell to the underwater demolition teams, composed of selected Navy and Marine volunteers, popularly known as frogmen. The underwater demolition men had to be able to swim long distances underwater and to work well completely on their own. The frogmen had to work quickly, first in locating the obstacle to be removed, natural or artificial, and then to set the high explosive charge correctly under the most difficult conditions. Then the trick was to get back to the pickup boat without being spotted by the enemy. Once safely out of the immediate area, the job was completed. During the latter years of World War II, the frogmen enabled many invasions to go off smoothly. Early on D-Day morning, the Navy's warships sought to soften up the beaches by the final pre-invasion bombardment. On shore was expected to be another Tarawa, the Navy complained that they had run out of targets. But there were many installations which the Navy's guns did not even touch. As H hour neared, the combat information center aboard ship became the nerve center of the operation. At 6.30 on D-Day morning, the amphibian tractors carrying their complement of assault troops started for the line of departure, the area from which the final dash to the beach would be begun. The landing craft, each one a part of a designated wave, rendezvoused before making the coordinated move toward the beaches. In the Palau invasion, each step of the operation by each unit was reported to the top commanders on the command ship. They were thus able to gain an overall picture of the situation. Wave one cross final line of departure at 0825. On deck, the troop commanders watched anxiously as the landing craft moved toward the beaches. The assault troops were preceded by a rocket barrage directed against the area behind the landing beaches. Resistance on Peleliu was expected to be heavy. As the armored amphibians moved toward shore, they drew heavy fire from the enemy, a good indication of what was in store on the beaches. As the landing craft neared the shore, the atmosphere aboard the command ship became charged with tension. Each message received from the assault units helped fill in a vital part of the broad mosaic of the battle for the beachhead. This was the first amphibious assault made by the 1st Marine Division to be opposed by the enemy. The landings at Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester, New Britain, had been nothing like this. In the Marine Corps, the 1st Division had earned the reputation of drawing operations which entailed easy landings. But at Peleliu, this tradition of good luck was dissipated. The first waves hit the beach to the accompaniment of intense enemy mortar and artillery fire. The prediction that it would be rough turned out to be an understatement. Casualties on the beaches were heavy. The 1st Marine Division was paying dearly for the small strip of coral and sand along Peleliu's western shore. To hold on to the slim foothold, the Marines had to drive quickly inland to deepen their beachhead. In the face of withering enemy fire, they pushed ahead. On the left flank, the battle was particularly tough. The 3rd Battalion of the 1st Marine Regiment ran into very heavy opposition. A brutal fight developed. On D-Day on Peleliu, the situation reports on the fierce and confused fighting were relayed regularly to the top command. The line against the enemy was broken by two major gaps, 
so serious that the position of the entire U.S. force on the island was endangered. 